Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. This is Ryan Crodel at Valencell. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us here today for what will be uh, an extremely interesting uh, webinar on biometrics in VR, and particularly VR uh, in the applications uh, in, in healthcare towards pain management. So. I'll we'll talk about some much broader topics beyond that, but um, a lot of interesting things going on in this area. We still have um, people uh, joining as we speak, so we're going to give it uh, another minute or two before we officially get started. And uh, so uh, bear with us for just a few minutes while others join and we'll get started. Okay, uh, well, thanks everyone again for, for joining us. We will go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Ryan Crodel with Valencell, and um, we are very happy to have with us today co-founder and CEO of First Hand Technology, a gentleman named Howard Rose, who will be our presenter here today. Uh, Howard and the, the folks at First Hand are doing some uh, some really interesting work with uh, virtual reality in the realm of pain management in hospitals and healthcare facilities and using biometrics as a part of that virtual experience in helping people uh, reduce pain and in some cases drastically reduce pain uh, without the use of, of any form of uh, pharmaceuticals or opioids. So um, uh, we'll get to Howard in just a moment. A few housekeeping items up front uh, before uh, before we dive in. So um, if you have questions as we go along throughout the presentation, we will take those questions as we go along. Please do submit those questions through the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, I'll be monitoring those questions and we'll uh, we'll bring those up as they uh, as they come in and uh, address those. We also have time built in at the end for Q&A if you, uh, you want to wait for, uh, for the end as well to ask your questions. But please do submit those um, as you think of them, or if there's anything you want us to dive deeper on, uh, just let us know through the GoToWebinar interface. Secondly, one of the questions we almost always get is, will the slides from the presentation be made available? And the answer, as usual, is yes. We will make these slides available through SlideShare, and we are also recording this webinar, so we will, and we, we post the recording of the webinar to our YouTube channel, and we will um, distribute links to both the webinar recording as well as the slides, uh, usually within about 24 hours of the webinar. So look out for those, and please do feel free to share those with anyone uh, in your organization or, or otherwise that might be interested in this topic and, and uh, interested in uh, hearing more about it. So uh, with that, I will hand over to Howard Rose to dive into the presentation. Howard? Uh, hello. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, can you hear me? can hear you clearly. Okay, great. Hi. Uh, well, uh, hello. Good morning. Um, to all of you, I'm in California where it is morning indeed. Uh, and thanks to Valencell for having 
uh, me and firsthand uh, and giving us this opportunity to share our work in VR and healthcare. Uh, I wanted to cover um, sort of a, a range of topics, including uh, you know uh, work that we have done to date, uh, some data, and also uh, you know talk about the mechanisms of action and how we see uh, biometrics fitting into this uh, opportunity to really transform healthcare. Um, so let's see if I can move my slides here. So uh, yes, talk about, uh, I want to introduce uh, firsthand. Uh, hours, hours, reality. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. You need to go ahead and share your screen. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I'm not seeing your screen. Oh, okay. How's that? Much better. Yep, thank okay. you. Okay, sorry about that, a little technical difficulty. So firsthand in VR for healthcare, uh, virtual reality pain relief, and um, uh, some about the mechanism, mechanisms of action and the opportunities with biometrics uh, about hacking the senses. Um, so let's see. Um, so firsthand in VR for healthcare. Uh, this is a picture of me, uh, 1995, uh, when I got my start in virtual reality, and that is my mother. Uh, my mother is wearing a seven and a half pound helmet. Uh, back in the day, uh, a mobile VR system required two people to pick it up and put it in the van. Um, and I got my start at the Human Interface Technology Lab, or the HIT Lab, in Seattle at the University of Washington. And this was a really exciting time. We got to try uh, this budding new technology uh, and apply it to lots of different areas of education and health and other things. And we discovered a lot of uh, really great uses and uh, did a lot of great research. Um, and we, I started my company firsthand uh, with my partner, uh, Ari Hollander, uh, way back in uh, about 22 years ago. Uh, so we've been uh, building these applications ever since. Uh, I want to start out with a, a sort of a useful, de simple definition of VR uh, as a computer generated experience that evokes the sensation that the experience is real. Um, we, there's a lot more scientific and uh, uh, sort of technical uh, definitions out there, but I think this one uh, covers all of the important things. Uh, and really the, cent the central component is sensation and how that sensation relate relates to human experience and changes our perception of both our experience and ourselves. Um, most people, when they think about virtual reality and healthcare, they think of something like this, uh, robotic surgery or training, or uh, you know all all these great applications. Um, these are wonderful, uh, but the the challenge that faces healthcare and our society is is really big and in a way daunting. We spend uh, in the United States we spend three trillion dollars on healthcare a year, and we get the worst outcomes of any developed nation. And I think that's that's certainly not for a lack of technology. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think one of the, the key components is we spend a lot of our dollars on uh, care and on this treatment model. And with expensive machines like the Da Vinci, uh, which is a million dollars, um, great if you need surgery, but we can help people, uh, if we can help people with other kinds of interventions uh, before they get to the point of needing the, these kind of uh, big interventions, then uh, we can really, I think, affect both the, uh, the, the healthcare experience and also the economics behind it. Um, so we're, we're more interested in something that looks like this. Uh, the patient experience in the hospital, uh, either going through a procedure using VR as a way to help people through um, painful procedures, uh, at the, you know, like deep tissue injections or wound care or things like that, or post-procedure, um, we can help people uh, dealing with the recovery and using it for um, uh, rehab medicine and then for chronic pain as well to try to reduce the uh, amount of opioids that people are taking. 
Um, so our mission is to use technology to improve health by improving the personal experience. Uh, the work that we've done to date uh, spans what I talk about as, as three areas of, of healthcare. One is mental health. Uh, we've worked with uh, the Department of Defense building applications uh, like Iraq World for uh, treating battlefield PTSD. So these are soldiers who come back from uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, and you, they have uh, they have a lot of stress. They have a lot of compound problems. And using virtual reality simulations as a way to help people confront those uh, challenging memories, uh, using simulations in what is called graded exposure. So uh, the virtual simulation can be modulated uh, to uh, control the amount of stressors that the patient feels. And it's a tool for the therapist to help the patient confront those uh, frightening memories and hopefully uh, get over them. Uh, the middle one is, uh, that is our, our character. Her name is Dentitia. It's called, uh, that's an application called Attack of the S Mutans. Uh, and that was a project we did with the um, uh, National Institute of Health uh, on lifestyle and uh, using VR as a way to promote um, better self-care habits in oral health. Uh, and then on the right, we have cool. That's, uh, you know, in the area of physical health, virtual reality can be applied for uh, a number of different applications from fitness to actual therapies. Uh, cool is a, an application that we have. It's one of the, the uh, VR experiences that we're bringing to hospitals and clinics now uh, for pain relief uh, for acute and chronic pain. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So um, a, a little bit about uh, sort of the background and the problem of, of pain relief uh, in our society and in our health system now. Um, the patient experience today looks kind of like this. Uh, if you're in the hospital and you're, you're injured or you're, uh, you have some sort of uh, disease, uh, your experience lying in the bed is pretty much like this. I can't stand the pain. Uh, how much longer until I get more drugs? Uh, and all of this, the result is that people are hitting that nurse call button and they're hitting that uh, morphine pump and they're, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a great situation for the patient lying in the in the bed so when we introduce vr uh we're we're not just distracting them we're actually engaging them in in a, a fundamental way uh so what we see is we see less pain and stress when we have vr uh we we get better vital signs uh and that relates to biosensors and we'll talk about that in a moment uh lower demand for drugs uh, more active and engaged patients. So instead of just lying there and being uh, depressed and uh, and inactive, we have them engaged and uh, actually physically moving earlier. Uh, better outcomes and uh, improved patient satisfaction. So um, this is uh, an interesting and rather shocking uh, piece of data from the CDC. Uh, so they did a study and they found uh, that opioid prescriptions longer than five days in length significantly increase the likelihood of continued opioid use both one and three years later. So uh, five days, there's nothing magical about five days, but it just seems that if you are uh, have a procedure and you are using opioids on the sixth day, uh, or the seventh day, there's a dramatically increased likelihood that one year later or even three years later that you're going to still be using opioids. And that one year risk increases from 6% to 12%. So that's a really dramatic change. And uh, as everyone I think out there knows, we're, we're in the middle of an opioid crisis. The United States uses 80% of the pharmaceutical opioids, and we need to do a lot of things. And I think one of them is to change the prescribing of opioids, but it's also changing our uh, 
our desire or our expectations around uh, what recovery is. Uh, so we can uh, look for some alternatives and virtual reality is proving to be one of those interesting alternatives. So uh, this finding motivates us. So number one, uh, it really highlights the high need for non-drug pain relief alternatives. And it shows that interventions at the right time can potentially have a really big impact. If we can affect people in the first five days, uh, you know, maybe we can dramatically drop that, uh, drop that curve and help people over the long term. Um, GLOW is an example of one of our applications uh, for biofeedback and mindfulness and training. I'll also say uh, our, app, our, um, our website is firsthand.com and you can find a lot of the research data and the uh, videos that I'm showing here today uh, are, are on our website. So uh, this one involves a, uh, a heart rate sensor. We're using the Skosh uh, Rhythm Plus, uh, which we really like. Uh, it's low cost, it's durable, and uh, it's very effective for this kind of application. Um, I have a short video here, which I would like to show you. So, um, one moment. And so this is an example of uh, sort of uh, explains how it's used in a, in a hospital context. Uh, and then we'll dive deeper. After I had my surgery, I was in pain and feeling stressed out. To help me control the pain, my doctor suggested a solution with no side effects what he called immersive virtual reality, or VR. Glow is a place to relax. It's really simple. Put on a headset and you're transported to another world. You use your hands to gather fireflies in the moonlight. A lantern appears and you share the light. You're connected to a heart rate monitor and the calmer you are, the more fun you have. The doctor or nurse can see everything from their monitor and they can control the experience. I felt so rested and I forgot about my pain. Now I use it when I wake up to get going, during the day when I just need a break and it helps me to go to sleep. Why don't you give it a try? So, um, so that's uh, an example of uh, how it's being used. Uh, VR is being used in a in a kind of a bedside situation. Um, and again, we're using a heart rate monitor. And Glow uh, is a, is an experience where I think, as as uh, the video shows, um, you are uh, basically the scenario is you are in a in a forest, a quiet. Um, uh, natural setting, uh, and the the primary action in Glow is there are fireflies that are in your environment, and what we've done is uh, we've got a leap motion. So that was uh, you saw in the video uh, that there is a hand motion. They're not using any controllers. The leap motion is a uh, camera-based system for doing hand identification and uh, real-time hand and gesture recognition. So we've got your real hands in the virtual world and uh, the action to move uh, to, to use GLOW is just very simply closing your fingers, making a, a fist. Uh, and if you uh, the heart rate is integrated into the experience as sort of the primary driver. So uh, this is a closed loop biofeedback system. Uh, and uh, with the with the Skosh heart rate sensor, uh, the biofeedback uh, is uh, performed by uh, the heart rate is mon is monitored through the uh, th through the Skosh and connected to the computer by uh, Ant Plus technology. So um, if the patient has an elevated heart rate, the fireflies will just, they won't come to you. Uh, so that's a mindfulness cue that you need to be aware. Uh, 
and drop your heart rate, lower your heart rate, relax. And as you do that, uh, and you close your hands, the fireflies become, uh, they, they come to you and then you can play with them and you can move around and, and, uh, and all of that. Uh, and then there are some lanterns that appear and uh, you can share your light with a lantern, which is a, a very nice um, sort of metaphor for giving and for letting that, that pain go. Uh, and when the lanterns are full, they will fly away. So uh, this application glow is being used uh, in a, a number of different contexts for um, uh, acute and uh, for chronic pain. Uh, we have a chronic pain clinic, uh, for example, um, uh, Dr. Adrian Hamburger, who is at uh, the Yale New Haven Spinal Clinic. He's using GLOW with his patients, and he's experienced uh, a lot of different benefits. One of them is that he's actually seen his patients over time uh, reduce and even uh, get off of opioids using uh, virtual reality, which we're very excited about that kind of uh, result. So um, we, as a company firsthand, uh, we uh, focus primarily on developing these um, developing these VR experiences. So uh, we're essentially a software company, but we also uh, deal a lot with um, the hardware and helping hospitals and clinics get up to speed and and get. Uh, set up with virtual reality. So we create VR experiences that's cool and glow. Uh, that's a, a picture of the Skosh uh, Rhythm Plus uh, that we use. Um, we also do custom development and we support uh, hospitals and clinics and research uh, institutions uh, in developing research programs to better understand and uh, and develop new applications in VR. Uh, so a bit about the the range of technologies out there. Uh, probably um, everyone uh, is familiar with with uh, you know sort of consumer VR. I believe right now. Uh, so at the far end on the left, we have cell phone uh, drop-in systems. That's a daydream uh, from Google. Uh, these are great. Um, I think for clinical applications, we found that they're they're pretty minimal, but they're uh, they're improving. Uh, they're minimal in the sense that we uh, we really like full virtual reality experiences, which includes uh, components like six degrees of freedom. So uh, when you turn your head, uh, so a, a three degree of freedom system like your phone knows which direction you're looking, but it doesn't know your position in space. So when it just knows your pitch, roll, and yaw, that's three degrees of freedom. And when it knows that and whether you're uh, where you are in, in three dimensions of space, whether you're looking under a table or your, uh, your head is tilted um, uh, or you're moving around in physical space, that's called six degrees of freedom. So uh, the HTC Vive um, is the, the one that we've been using for the longest. Uh, HTC is coming out with a new uh, all-in-one system. It's called the Focus. Uh, that's a self-contained, uh, it's got the, C, the CPU and the GPU inside of it, uh, and they're bringing that to, to the US uh, right now. Um, PC-based uh, VR is, has been our primary uh, platform. The reason there is that we get uh, the best quality and we get uh, also um, you know, a, a lot of the ability to put a lot of peripherals into the system. So uh, the Windows Mixed Reality System, is uh, that's an HP. Uh, there are partners in bringing this solution to hospitals. Uh, we work a lot with HP and also Intel. Um, uh, the Vive and the uh, or Oculus, our software supports both uh, on on a laptop or a full blown uh, what we call the MetaCart, uh, which is a touch screen and a, a high end desktop. Um, so uh, we help uh, hospitals get up to speed and and get all of these systems with a turnkey solution. Uh, these are some of the hospitals that we've been working with. Um, uh, there are 
uh, it's a growing number, and we're excited that uh, you know a lot of hospitals we've moved past the first adopter stage and kind of just the research phase, and we're really seeing a, a lot of uptake in uh, sort of mainstream hospitals and chronic pain clinics as well. Um, and eventually, we are uh, moving this to uh, a home context. We're kind of not really moving it there yet because of the the installed base of VR systems is not really there yet. But uh, I think that's really where the promise of this technology is going to shine. Uh, I want to share a quick um, story. This is uh, Lieutenant Sam Brown. Uh, he was um, he was injured in Afghanistan and uh, he used VR. Uh, this is a story from 2012. That's from GQ magazine uh, and. Uh, Sam is uh, used VR for helping him through uh, wound care and uh, skin grafts and lots of painful procedures. So uh, patients like Sam, uh, their experience has three components, is anxiety, helplessness, and pain. And the first two, anxiety and helplessness, really contribute to this uh, transformation of pain into suffering. And VR can intervene in that uh, process and, and really reduce the amount of pain, but also the amount of suffering that patients feel. So here's a quick video uh, of Sam Brown, uh, and you can see how it works in a uh, clinical context. I was on fire. I couldn't see to unbuckle my seatbelt or open the door. I believe my guardian angel just took me out of the truck. First Lieutenant Samuel Brown survived an attack on his Humvee in Southern Afghanistan but he would then have to endure rounds of surgery, skin grafts, and painful skin stretching. This is a battle that's gonna take years to, to get back to being how it was prior to this. But while Brown's body fights that battle, virtual reality technology lets his brain enjoy hurling snowballs to the music of Paul Simon. University of Washington researchers Hunter Hoffman and David Patterson designed the virtual reality game Snow World to occupy burn patients' minds during painful wound cleaning or physical therapy. Snow World's the opposite of, of fire. Snowy, cold, it's supposed to cancel out and help distract them from remembering their original injury. Their previous research showed that not only do patients report less pain in Snow World, MRI scans show it reduces the brain's pain signals. Brown's doctors see real improvement. What we saw was marked improvement in the range of motion that we were able to achieve, and most importantly, an increased uh, level of comfort. As published in the Journal of Cyber Therapy and Rehabilitation, the soldiers even report a fun quotient. I spent some time growing up out in Colorado skiing during the winters and stuff, so, you know, if, if anything, it, you know, it sort of brings back some of those memories. A cool escape for a war hero putting the pieces back together. I'm Brad Cross. So um, uh, I'd like to share some of the data. So we worked on Snow World with um, uh, Hunter Hoffman and David Patterson for many years, and uh, that uh, it was used in a lot of uh, different studies. Uh, I'd like to share some of uh, some of that data. Uh, this is an fMRI study that was done with uh, healthy patients and looking at the changes in the brain uh, with induced pain. Um, that was thermal pain. Uh, and uh, looking at the difference in what happens in the brain uh, when you use VR. So uh, the areas of the brain that are uh, really active during uh, you know, painful or stressful situations, the insula, the thalamus, and the ACC. The insula is, is uh, sort of that, that uh, center that deals with sensory pain. The thalamus is a uh, communication, kind of it, it passes pain signals around. Uh, and the ACC it, uh, relates to our emotional experience of pain. Uh, and if you, uh, you can see that uh, with VR, what we see on the left is that these areas are very active, and on the right, you see a lot less activity in those areas. And what's really exciting is that you see that that activity, that brain activity, moves to other areas of the brain, the pre prefrontal cortex, uh, areas engaged with um, uh, positive things like coping, resilience, uh, 
and uh, cognition and all of that. So uh, that's a really great picture uh, and really exciting uh, data there. Uh, so here's a study. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, we had yeah. a question come in about GLOW that's, that's relevant here. And it, the question is, is the biofeedback used to optimize content delivery in real time? Uh, yes. So uh, in GLOW, uh, the, it, it is a closed loop biofeedback system. It doesn't, uh, we are not actually, um, say the, the scenario stays the same, if that's the question. Um, but it does uh, respond to the patient in real time with the biosensor. Got it. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, here's some some data. Uh, so this is a comparison of uh, uh, no treatment control compared to opioids, uh, VR and VR plus opioids. And we're just going to look uh, briefly at the no treatment uh, opioid and VR comparison. So. Um, as compared to the no treatment control, uh, the VR reduced pain better than opioids. And uh, the time thinking about the pain uh, was much less with VR than with opioids. Uh, so think of this about uh, catastrophizing uh, and part of that, um, that real conversion about anxiety and stress and how that uh, affects the overall pain and suffering experience. Um, and then my favorite, the amount of fun. Uh, people are clearly having a lot more fun uh, in VR. And I think what's also interesting is that the opioids are actually less fun than the no treatment control. And I think that points to how uh, opioids, we, we feel kind of wooden, we don't feel very good, and it affects our quality of life uh, in a big way. So um, that's, that's a really interesting uh, sort of, uh, example of how that uh, plays out. So at least in this case, we can say that uh, VR worked better than the drugs. Um, here's uh, from the same study, here's an image of, uh, of what's going on in the brain. And those uh, same areas, the ACC, uh, the insula, the somatosensory cortex, uh, primary and secondary, and the thalamus. Uh, so you can see that on the left, that's the control. And as we move to the right, uh, the brain activity is significantly reduced. Uh, and then the overall uh, finding from this study was that uh, the VR uh, on its own was extremely effective as we saw in the previous slides. Uh, but when you uh, bring uh, VR and drugs together as a, uh, an adjunct uh, and a compound therapy, you get even better results. Um, so here's a study with uh, chronic pain patients using our application COOL. Uh, this was done uh, at the pain consultants of East Tennessee with Dr. Ted Jones and uh, James Chu. Um, they found that 94% uh, of their patients, these are neuropathic pain patients uh, like Matt over there, who was a veteran of Desert Storm. Uh, he has um, neuropathic pain. Um, and uh, he 94 percent of these patients received a benefit 92 percent after uh of that benefit uh 92 percent of the patients had a benefit after they took the helmet off and you're seeing 60 to 70 percent reductions during vr and 30 to 50 percent reductions after so uh what's significant here is that we see that vr has a profound and lasting effect uh, it's not just a distraction. A distraction effect would stop when you took the helmet off, uh, but we're really seeing that that uh, persists and helps people uh, far beyond that. Um, uh, this is a, a study, an implementation study at Providence Cancer Center uh, in Portland. Um, pancreatic cancer patients, post-invasive surgery. This is very much like the, the video that you saw, uh, bedside, um, helping people try to, uh, you know, get active and get engaged uh, after uh, large incision surgeries. Uh, they had 29 patients uh, used Cool and Glow and compared this, the results to historical data. 30% uh, reductions in pain, so that's 30% better than the than the standard of care. 20% uh, reductions in the use of opioids and uh, a strong trend to reduce the cost of care. Um, and so we're uh, 
engage, we're working with uh, Providence and their rehab medicine to do um, some follow-up implementations and spread it throughout their system. Uh, so the VR benefits for uh, the stakeholders, for the doctors, the hospitals, the nurses, and the payers. Uh, I won't read through all of this, but uh, we basically, for the doctors, we get happier patients uh, with lower risks. Uh, the hospitals were giving, uh, you know, we see benefits in the ROI, increased efficiency, reduced risk exposure. Uh, the nurses really like it because they have something to offer the patients besides just drugs. And the payers, uh, ultimately, uh, we're working with some payers to uh, develop some new reimbursement uh, approaches and reducing the risk and the outcomes and reducing uh, addiction, which has a high cost. So uh, something I wanna kind of uh, wrap this up with uh, talking about, you know, the biometrics and VR. Uh, so just to, to start with, we, it, Probably many of you are familiar with what's called the mirror box, um, phantom limb. Uh, Ramachandran and Ramachandran uh, are famous for this work and using it with amputees who are suffering from uh, pain and clenching spasms. And it's a great example of how the visual channel can override uh, that sensory channel. And uh, so it's a, it's kind of hacking into the body map. It's using the visual channel to override that sensation from from your hand and that can have a profound effect uh so this is a, a patient in glow and and in the sort of digital therapeutic context uh we can do that and uh, and a lot more uh this is a model that we call the virtuality manifold um uh, it's a model of the human machine environment interaction and talks to the you know kind of illustrates that how that works um, in terms of uh, experiences and inputs and outputs. So uh, the human environment relationship uh, is sensation and action. So sensations, uh, we get sensations from the environment and you, you know through our sensory channels and we can act on the uh, environment outside of it. Uh, the human machine interaction level uh, is display and biometrics. And biometrics are key to uh, creating a, a, a loop so that the machine knows about us and responds to us. And the machine uh, environment, uh, we're terming that as perception and reach. So uh, perception is, uh, is where the computer understands and uh, computer visualization and, and uh, understands the environment in some way physically or uh, what's going on in terms of uh, sensors and uh, reach is uh, either uh, through robotics uh, is one channel or it can be also through a network or data or sharing the experience out into the world um, and this is our our model of uh, sort of uh, it helps us think about how uh, virtual experiences can be constructed and virtual reality so everybody's probably familiar with vr and ar and mixed reality uh, and we look at that as uh, tweaking different points on this continuum so there's a continuum between virtuality and reality uh, and if we can it's really just how much we modulate for example uh, augmented reality would be uh, opening up that channel between uh, your sensation and your ability to act on the environment, uh, whereas an occluded, completely virtual experience would be really primarily um, focused on the machine layer and the, the biofeedback uh, with the opportunity to interact on the environment through the machine. Uh, so that's our, our kind of general model of the technology. And when we look at that in terms of the internal experience um, for the for someone going through pain or or treatment. Uh, this is uh, what's called the neuromatrix model from uh, Melzack and Wall, a uh, very well-known model uh, for uh, kind of modeling the, the human experience as something uh, dynamic and it's uh, affected by cognition and emotion and our senses. And, and those are the inputs into the system. And then within our, our brain and body, We've, we have a whole bunch of different components. We have goals, 
We have our own stories about the pain and how we perceive it, uh, meaning uh, our own internal emotions, our emotional reaction. Uh, and then on the other side, on the right, we have outputs, um, our perception of pain, our actions, and our stress regulation uh, response. And then uh, mapping that to the previous slide, uh, the inputs uh, from our previous slide, sensation, display, perception, uh, can affect those input sides, our cognition and emotional level. And on the right, we have action and biometrics, uh, and then and how that can affect uh, the the output and and create a loop here with biofeedback and uh, and biosensors. So uh, let's see. So this is. Uh, our model for the mechanisms of action and uh, uh, what we call embodied medicine. So embodied medicine is uh, altering the experience of being in a body to improve health and wellness. So uh, in the center, we have kind of the, uh, the superpowers of VR, immersion, interaction, uh, the psychophysical, cognitive and emotional levels. And starting with immersion that uh, we can uh, immersion is sort of where VR starts. It's uh, it, it's the basis of the phenomenon, and it enables uh, the patient to self-regulate. Um, and the active and creative component of VR uh, is also really crucial. And uh, example would be studies of Snow World that compare it to passive media, show that interaction is is a really important part of that uh, pain reduction effect that we see. Uh, so VR is much more effective than looking at a DVD or other kinds of passive uh, media. Uh, VR is a psychophysical experience, uh, which uh, there's, for example, in cool, we go over a waterfall uh, gently, uh, and uh, but every time the patient goes over that waterfall, they feel that psychophysical uh, feeling of motion. Um, and uh, this relates both in terms of the sensory learning uh, so changing the pathways in the brain, as we saw in those kinds of slides, and manipulating the body map. I think that's a real com important component of, of the whole overall effect, uh, where we, we change that body map and we change that relationship to our physical body through VR, uh, much like Ramachandran's uh, mirror box example. Uh, cognition, uh, mental strategies and resilience, mindfulness, and building those kinds of uh, approaches, more like cognitive behavioral therapy, and the emotional level, motivation, and positive psychology. Uh, and this relates to therapeutic targets, uh, down regulation, self regulation. We have psychiatrists using uh, applications like GLOW with, um, with kids who have emotion regulation or uh, inhibition control problems. Uh, and that's that's proving helpful in that in that realm. Um, uh, patient engagement and activation. Doctors hate it when patients just sit there in the bed and uh, you know expect to uh, be cured. Uh, and they are very excited about VR because it engages the patient and activates them in their own healing. Um, rehab, uh, kinesophobia, the the fear of moving, uh, neurological disorders uh, using VR. And we're seeing some uh, really interesting results out there where VR can actually uh, change, uh, remap some of that uh, for people who quadriplegics, for example. It can help remap some of the, the connections between the brain and the body by using that visual channel. Um, that's very exciting. Uh, mindfulness skills, habits development, um, and of course, knowledge using VR as a way to uh, deliver some uh, public health messages as an attack of the S-mutants. Uh, and then uh, the top level, emotion, stress, depression, and uh, there's a correlation between our uh, stress response and inflammation, uh, and also kind of a psychological mental health uh, catharsis that's going on. So um, uh, just in terms of the biosensors, where we can use them to ultimately uh, induce flow states. Uh, this is kind of where this is all going. Uh, flow is the mental state of immersion, energized focus, full enjoyment, peak performance. Sports is a great example. When you're in the flow, you're, you're doing your best, you've got optimum challenge, and you're responding to that challenge in the most engaged way. Uh, and then flow and awareness, uh, 
there's an action response loop here. Uh, and uh, there's a picture of our skosh. Um, and so what we can do is we can create an immediately an immediate closed biofeedback loop, uh, merges action and awareness. Uh, it loosens uh, this reflective self-consciousness. So that's kind of gets back to this body map idea that instead of sitting there and thinking about my my uh, hurt shoulder, that I'm I'm engaged and I'm moving forward uh, instead of stuck where I am. Uh, feel the potential to succeed. That's optimal challenge and and using and tuning that experience with VR uh, uh, and the biosensors and feeling so engrossed that other needs become negligible. Um, and so this is uh, where we're heading in our uh, work at first hand is to enhance uh, virtual reality with biosensors and AI. So on the left, we have a quantified virtual experiences with either uh, biosensors or interaction data, uh, neural sensors or hooking to uh, rehab devices such as treadmills. And then uh, on the right, we can uh, share that data with patients and doctors and payers and also get data from them and feed it into the system. Ultimately in the sensor, what we're trying in, in the center, what we're trying to do is to optimize each session uh, uh, over over the, the course of the session and try to reduce pain for them now. And then in the course of the trajectory of their recovery down at the bottom, we want to return them to healthy function faster. So uh, following them longitudinally and changing uh, the, the therapeutic pathway to increase the, the and speed recovery. So uh, some quick conclusions, the benefits of VR and biosensors. Uh, we want to improve the patient experience. That's the primary goal. We want to transition care from the clinic to the home, which is where we see the real benefits affecting both uh, the quality of care and also the uh, cost are, uh, benefits. Um, alternative to opioids, uh, we want to reduce the cost at the point of care, uh, which is uh, where we think that uh, we can have the most effect, uh, improve current treatments and develop new ones, uh, and activate patients in their own recovery. So uh, ultimately, VR therapy gives us uh, new insights into the brain, body, and behavior. So we can actually learn more about how we as organisms function and how we respond and and how we can intervene. Uh, and with biosensors, we have a way to affect the whole person in real time uh, and uh, achieve something more than uh, just going and, and getting a procedure. Uh, so that is my presentation uh, and I welcome any questions and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Howard. Great stuff there. Um, we really appreciate that. That um, I'll just quick reminder to all of the uh, all of the attendees. Please do submit questions through the the go to webinar uh, control panel. Uh, I've got a few questions in here. Um, uh, uh, Howard, this kind of goes back to the second to last slide you just showed. This uh, I've heard of a concept of uh, sort of a virtual uh, virtual pharmaceutical cabinet, if you will, for applying different virtual environments to different um, different uh, uh, ailments, whether that's um, uh, acute pain due to uh, surgery recovery or chronic pain due to um, uh, say chronic inflammation or something along those lines. Do you see that, or how do you see that progressing? What are your thoughts on this concept of different virtual environments or different digital therapeutics for, for different ailments? Sure, I think ultimately uh, that is the direction that we we will be going. Um, you know, we, we started as, a, we started with, you know, targeted uh, experiences, for example, for PTSD or for pain. Um, you know, virtual reality is, people talk about it sort of in a, a big general term, but uh, it's all locked up in the experience. Uh, all of the value and all of the the kind of benefits really relate to the type of experiences that you create and not all VR is created equal. So, um, 
I think that people are, uh, the general population is starting to recognize that more. Uh, from our perspective, uh, of course, we need to uh, develop a, a specific targeted intervention for specific groups uh, is going to give you a better outcome, uh, both in terms of acceptance and uh, creating experiences that they're, they're going to like and uh, will appeal, but uh, also that, it, that address uh, specific brain areas. Uh, for example, there are levels of cognition. Uh, if you think about cognitive behavioral therapy and how you target that to someone with an eating disorder versus someone with uh, a chronic pain or opioid problem, uh, it's pretty evident that we can uh, embody those kinds of therapies uh, inside of the virtual experience. Very cool. Um, next question. So uh, is there is there any process to combine your technology with pain reduction TENS units such as made by Bayer? Uh, we do see that that uh, you know clinicians are combining this with different other modalities. Uh, I think what's important is that we've moved uh, towards an integrated pain, um, an integrated approach to to dealing with pain rather than just doling out pharmaceuticals. So we do see in different um, clinical contexts where VR is being integrated into physical therapy, yoga, mindfulness, acupuncture. Uh, specifically for us, we are not, um, you know, integrating it specifically with TENS machines. Uh, those, uh, you know, they can be beneficial. Uh, we kind of leave that up to the clinician or the, the patient. Um, but, uh, you know, there's no reason that uh, people can't uh, do those kinds of things if as long as there's compatibility with the hardware. Uh, you know, people are pretty inventive, especially people with uh, pain. Uh, they're very inventive at finding their own solutions. So uh, I welcome any of those kinds of, of solutions if they're working for people. Got it. Uh, next question is, what about your contents experience separates it from your competitors? Well, um, so uh, number one, we start with uh, our applications are built for this use. So we're not repurposing something that was either a, an entertainment application or something like that. Uh, and because we start from that uh, point, we're uh, you know, we're able to uh, build in the the types of experiences and affordances and and goals and data collection and all of that that really is is what uh, the healthcare industry is is looking for. Uh, in terms of the experience, I'll say that uh, number one in healthcare, we we want to do no harm. And in that, for example, in that study, uh, the the pilot study at uh, Providence Cancer Center. These were pancreatic cancer patients who have really high levels of pain. Uh, and they also have uh, nausea, stress, anxiety. They have, they have real uh, sensitivities. Uh, we had zero, um, literally zero cases of simulation sickness um, and uh, any adverse effects, no, no headache, none of that. Uh, and that's really important because VR can be, uh, if not done well and carefully, uh, it can induce some other kinds of, uh, you know, uh, nasty feelings. Uh, so we build our applications, first of all, to uh, be comfortable. Uh, they're immediately uh, accessible. So if you have a patient who is going through uh, debriding or wound care, uh, they're already stressed out. They may be taking drugs. They, they're not going to take, uh, you know, they're not going to uh, go through a long, uh, you know, tutorial about how to use the application. They need to turn it on and go and be successful. Uh, so there are things uh, that we do to facilitate that. Uh, we also, you know, games are, a lot of applications out there are uh, sort of designed to, um, you know, uh, get people engaged and you know you think about typical game paradigms they're they're there to stress you out uh, you know you're chased by zombies and things uh and we've had patients say things like uh, we have so cool uses uh it cool is essentially you're playing paintball with otters uh 
um, and who doesn't love an otter? Uh, but uh, we have patients saying, you know, when I found out the otters were not going to attack me, I, I had fun. Uh, and we're also seeing a lot of benefit with different kinds of patients. So our applications are useful for, for kids as well as adults and seniors. So those are some of the points. Thanks, Howard. And great questions. Keep them coming in uh, through the go to webinar control panel. Um, a few others that have come in here. Uh, different biosensors are used during the entire process of VR. Do we have something which can be downsized to everyday smart bands such as Apple Watch, Fitbit, Garmin and make it accessible for outpatients for their treatments? Uh, sure. So uh, one reason we, we like the Skosh here is that um, uh, it does stream the data and what that's real important to us so we can get direct access to the data coming out of that device unfortunately there's not a lot of devices out there that do that if you look at the apple watch um, it's sending all of the signals up to the mothership uh, and then they come back and that round trip can take you know seconds uh, which is not a great kind of situation when you're trying to do biofeedback that's immediately responsive so um the the other thing about the Scosche is it, it runs on a, um, it uses a flexible band so we can either put it on a, a wrist or an arm um, uh, and, and you can make it secure. Uh, the watches tend to be a little noisy, uh, but I think ultimately, uh, you know, hopefully in the future, all of that is going to get kind of ironed out. Um, but the access to the data stream is real important. And unfortunately, there's a, not a lot of devices that give us access to that so my pitch to folks out there building these app building this hardware uh please give us access to the data direct access to the data stream and we can uh we can do more with it good stuff and actually this next question is uh is a good or that that answer is a good segue to this next question how much if at all do you leverage data analytics and analysis on biofeedback and consumer feedback to continuously improve content uh, well, if, uh, you know, consumer feedback and user feedback, we're, we're very attentive to that in terms of trying to make uh, more experiences. We've got other things in development uh, targeted for uh, more specific uses like rehab and, and using sensors, uh, both uh, physical sensors on, on the limbs and also other bio streams. Uh, ultimately, we can, uh, in terms of the biofeedback and the data, you get the best data when you uh, you aggregate multiple streams, uh, such as uh, multiple sensors or using sensors and looking at interaction data and correlating those. Uh, that's really embodied in the the platform that we're developing, so that instead of uh, sort of hard coding this into each application, we can generalize it. So we, uh, our platform is, um, you know, we're gathering uh, data from all of those sources, uh, both in terms of the interaction and the sensory data and neuro data. Uh, there are, we're working with some uh, clinic, clinicians who are uh, interested in, uh, you know, neural training and using VR as a way to uh, enhance neural training and give people uh, the benefits of immersion and interaction uh, a, a, along with the biofeedback and, and trying to control your, your own uh, uh, kind of physiology. So uh, I think the future is really bright um, and we're, we're, we're really seeing our, where we are now is to really prove those cases out in the, the real world with hospitals and clinics. Uh, so if you're a clinician, you know, please get in touch with me. And if you're interested in bringing this to your clinic, uh, we've got a lot of data from the lab. Um, but the real challenge, I think, is is getting it into the flow of care, uh, showing the adoption, showing the ROI, showing the, the, the real benefits that this brings to patients and the health system. Uh, and data is what drives all of that. So using the biosensors as a way to prove and to show uh, has been really effective. Cool. Um, uh, we're getting near the top of the hour and we had this scheduled for an hour. Um, Howard, do you have a few more minutes? There's a few more questions that have come in. So we sure, can go I'm ahead. Fine, yeah. Okay, okay, very good. Um, next question was, uh, what, are the, uh, what are the result differences based on age or gender, if any? 
Uh, really interesting question. I think there there are some studies out there that look at the reaction and and the experience in head mounted displays and and gender differences. Uh, there is some suggestion that men and women have a different experience, and um, I do think that some of those are uh, uh, kind of uh, those studies do depend on the kind of of equipment and and hardware and and uh, visual quality and um, and all of that. We do know that women's eyes are better. Uh, they have more receptors. Um, so uh, that's probably has something to do with it. Um, so uh, gender reactions, I think probably the biggest area where that is, uh, you know, significant is in the types of content. Um, and we try to make our applications, you know, based on where we are and trying to uh, develop the, the market and to create applications that are going to work for a lot of different patients. So that's a, another difference, but, uh, you know, in what we create is that, that you know, when a, when a doctor is, is uh, having, integrating VR into their practice, they need to know that it's going to work for a lot of different patients. Uh, and I can't be running around and choosing, well, this one and this one and this one. Uh, it's much easier to, to have something that's consistent that you know works. And so, uh, you know, as in that pain consultants of East Tennessee study, 94% uh, of the patients got a benefit. We see that at, at Providence and a lot of these other uh, uh, locations. So uh, part of it is building an application that is going to appeal to uh, different demographics, different genders, different uh, sort of uh, preferences. Um, of course, we need more content, uh, you know, and we're building more content. There's other uh, people out there who are building content. And uh, I think that we're going to, uh, as that content pool grows, uh, we will see it sort of divide and, and you know, things that, that deal with specific demographic groups or genders or things like that. But right now we're, we're doing pretty well. Uh, we see even seniors and older women are having as good an experience as, as younger guys. So uh, that's encouraging. Good, good. Um, one last question I see that has come in. Um, anyone else who's still on, please do um, submit any last questions you have. Um, the question is, are there any patients who got addicted to the VR and want to use it for entertainment purposes apart from their treatment? Um, I, I think that, uh, okay, there, there's a couple things wrapped up in there. I, I think there's, uh, you know, particularly there's been some stuff in the news about uh, game addiction and things like that. Um, I think that uh, VR, I, I mean, it's certainly, it's something I, I, I you know, I guess we might take seriously a little farther down the line. I think right now we don't see, um, you know, we're not seeing people want to stay in VR for hours and hours and hours. Um, and I think, uh, you know, part of that is um, where we are sort of in the the technology and uh, the feeling of of the experience of, of having the head, headsets on, et cetera. Um, but I, I, I guess I'm not concerned about the, the negative side of addiction. I do think that what we're targeting is, um, you know, it, also in that question is what's the dose, <clears throat> what's the dose response? Um, and we're seeing that uh, patients are getting a benefit from even uh, a five minute experience or pretty typically we're seeing 15 to 20 minute experiences. Uh, in the clinic. Uh, that's mostly governed, I think, by uh, kind of the flow of care and the protocols and the practicalities of what happens in the clinic. Uh, that just seems to work. Um, and and we're getting, we're seeing significant benefits at those kinds of uh, exposure times. So uh, on one side of this, I, I don't think that we need to, uh, we, we don't want to, we don't need to immerse people you know, 24 seven, that's not our goal. What we wanna do is to give them a powerful experience that when they take the headset off that they can close their eyes and they can go back there mentally. Uh, we are very interested in linking VR to other types of devices and uh, we're actively 
uh, kind of extending the VR experience out into other devices, you know, into uh, uh, even into tech systems and other kinds of things. I think that's uh, it. VR is not just going to be an island out there. So um, I do think that when patients are at home, uh, you know, it's it's totally up to them. Uh, and we we do have a few patients using it at home. And I think what they do is they they kind of use it as a tool in their toolbox. Um, I don't think that, you know, people want to be functional uh, and you can't really be functional if you're always in VR. They want to have a quality of life. They want to live. They want to go out. They want to work. And uh, I, VR, uh, you know, the exciting thing is that it enables people. It seems to enable people to, to have a benefit after uh, they take the helmet off. And I think that's our real goal, not to keep people in VR. Um, and, you know, we haven't seen that addiction problem yet. Uh, and I don't think we will for quite a while. Good. Um, next question is, would it be worthy to have, uh, sorry, would it be worth having content based on the patient's lifestyle or interest preferences? For example, say a patient likes fly fishing, would that enhance the results? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I think I think potentially it can enhance the results, uh, but you know what? Uh, when you're in a clinical context, uh, and you know you have to deal with lots of different age and demographics and preferences, uh, that's kind of a slippery slope when you're trying to meet everybody's needs. Um, and so I think that, you know, practically speaking, for creating applications. We want things that are going to work for a lot of different people. And, uh, you know, we, for example, we use otters and who doesn't love an otter? Um, if we use dogs, uh, there's a lot of people who love dogs and a lot of people who don't love dogs. Um, or it evokes, I had a really bad experience and was bitten by a dog. Um, we have fireflies. Who doesn't love a firefly? Um, so I think part of it is the kind of, uh, it's it's tempting to say, well, I want uh, you know fly fishing for the for the sports uh, people out there, um, and certainly I think that there's value there. But I but in terms of creating a medical kind of intervention that's going to go into a clinic and being used with a lot of people, what we find is that you need to be a little more uh, a little more general and also a little potentially less literal. Um, and, and our experiences are, you know, it's not a realistic recreation of, uh, of the river runs through it. It's a, um, there is a river in, uh, in cool and we're following where that and the journey through a landscape and we go through caves and, but it's not, uh, it, it we found that, that if you kind of step back away from trying to be actually realistic, uh, that you can make these experiences a lot more engaging and, you know, playing with that virtuality is really fun. And, uh, you know, so, so that's kind of our design approach. Got it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and the last one here is uh, probably a great way to wrap up. Not a question, just a comment. Thanks for your time. Very informative and best of luck. Very exciting space. Uh, we, we certainly agree. And, um, so I'll say Thank thanks everyone for your time, uh, taking time out of your busy schedule today and all the great questions. Hope you enjoyed the webinar and Howard to you. Thank you very much for the time and the insights and the, the great presentation. I think this was really valuable and we really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. And uh, I appreciate it. If people want to contact me, uh, you can find uh, more information where firsthand.com. Uh, there's a contact form and please get in touch. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.